Welcome to this week's episode of Listen to Your Coaches. I'm your coach, Mike Wilkins, here with Coach Will Morrill. On this week's episode, we're going to discuss... Mike doesn't know. So, here's all I've got planned for today. <clears throat> I was a little sneaky. I hit up some of our fighters. No way! I made a little group with them called Don't Tell Mike... Um, and, uh, oh man, this is, I'm nervous. I asked them for some questions that they would want to hear you answer on the pod. Oh no. In addition, I have some questions myself for you that, uh, (laughs) you get to answer. (laughs) Dude, I can't believe it. All right. So we've got different questions from different people in different, um, uh, categories. Uh, some of them I'm going to piggyback onto and some of them I'll, I'll keep in order, but, uh, Let's get to it. So let's start right at the top here. This is a great idea. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I thought you would enjoy this. <clears throat> so my first question for you comes from a Mr. Lucas Siebert. I don't know if you've heard of the fellow. But, heard of the kid. Uh, <laughs> I heard of the kid. His question is, if you had to eat at one restaurant for the rest of your life, what restaurant and why is it Applebee's? <laughs> well, it's Applebee's. I had a similar question for you, but that one I was just like, all right, we gotta take that. Well, it's Applebee's because Applebee's is the same all the time. Consistency is key. And it's I'm... consistent, and you know what you're gonna get, mm-hmm. and there's one everywhere. Yeah. So, like, for the record, Applebee's is not my favorite restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just if we're out of town, I am risk adverse. Yeah. Okay? I like to keep it very safe and when simple. When it comes to food, yes. Yeah. So I'm going to Applebee's. <laughs> In fact, um, we recently, I don't, depending on when this airs, we recently discussed on a, a recent podcast about us going, uh, the some of the fighters taking a trip to New York, New Jersey area. <clears throat> In which in that podcast, I had to admit that I sat at an Applebee's bar for like six hours Watching football and drinking Angry Orchards. I'll do one better. You and I once cornered back-to-back fights <laughs> on a Friday and Saturday night. Yeah, and that weekend. So here's the thing. Like I very much like like. Well, they have a two for twenty, which is yeah. a great deal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's going to be the same. So I first got on Applebee's when I was fighting, because like I didn't want to like go like to some new restaurant and maybe get like sick. Right. Exactly. Before a fight, where I knew Applebee's. Very plain. And see, that's this. that's the argument that got me because I'm very like adventurous when it comes to food. I like different stuff. I like to try local things. And so we'll go on fight trips. And Mike's like Applebee's, and I was like, dude, what are we doing? And he was like, look, exactly what you said. Like, I know it's consistent, so I know what I'm getting. You know, it's a big chain, so they probably don't want like you know lawsuits. So they're gonna like cook the food well and everything. Yeah. And so it makes sense. I'm like, all right, cool. You know, before a fight, we got a fighter with us. Yeah, we'll hit Applebee's. That's fine. This particular weekend. We ate at Applebee's, I think, five times. Five times. Five times in three days. That was a little much even for me. Dude, but, uh... I loved it. Every <laughs> single time, I loved it. I loved it every single time. They got exactly what I want, what I need. I also have backup ones. They're called Buffalo Wild Wings. Yes. That's my backup. So, um, like, that's my nighttime one. Okay. So... Now that I'm a coach, that's my more one. But like when I was a fighter, I was like needed, needed like steak and mashed potatoes and mm-hmm. broccoli. Yeah. All right, so that, so that was a good question. That was I a have, great question, and I love how it was asked. Yeah, do you know what's funny is before he said that, it was I had Applebee's. literally the same question. It was, what's your favorite restaurant, and why is it Applebee's? No way. I had literally um, that, and then Lucas sent that, and I was like, all right, well, I mean, I yeah, got to you know, yeah. give it to him. So I have a follow-up question. This one's just from me. What's your favorite food? My favorite food? Yes. My favorite food is steak. That is also my favorite food. That's a good answer. I have been to a Fogo de Chao within the week. We went on Wednesday. Good spot. Wednesday afternoon. Good lunch. spot. Um, I have one other fallout question for you because yes. this is an area where you're a true connoisseur. Like some people, you know, oh, they know God. wine. All right, you know, go ahead. Some people know, you know, whatever. What it, is your favorite candy? My favorite candy? Yeah. Carmelo bars. Interesting. Yeah, refrigerated. Ooh. Do you know what a Carmelo bar is? Of course I do. I've eaten them with you on fight trips. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> so Carmelo bars, first off, if they're room temp, if they're melted, they suck. If they're room temp, they just don't hit the same. If they're frozen, the caramel inside is too solid. Tough, yeah. Too solid. If they're refrigerated, 
they have like a snappy crisp mm -hmm. when in the chocolate, and then the caramel is like not like sticky gooey, but still gooey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Carmelo bars refrigerated. It's that that Goldilocks zone. Yeah, Goldilocks. Yeah, yeah. It's and weird. actually, you know, this is just a question that, that just popped in my head, but it, the answer is already out there. Are you a caramel or caramel guy? Well, it, caramel is correct. Yeah, it is correct. People who say caramel, mm -hmm. they're pronouncing it wrong. And they're misunderstanding the people who say caramel. You're not. I'm not saying caramel. Yeah. C a r m e l. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. I'm saying car a mm -hmm. caramel. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's just nothing. Yeah. There it, yeah. They're like, oh, it, it's not caramel. There's an extra a in there. Yeah. I'm saying it. Caramel. <laughs> it's definitely not care a mole because there's no e after the r. It's an it's an accent a. It's just a little. It's just a little. Yeah. You know, or, yeah, uh, I'm not saying car mole. I'm saying caramel. <laughs> car a mole. Caramel. Oh, I love it. I hate people. <laughs> okay, and actually, while we're on this subject, I'm just going to finish out this uh, this particular subject. What is the strangest or weirdest food that I have personally made you eat? Is it that artichoke that I didn't like? <laughs> I mean, did you tell me? <laughs> what was it called? That I didn't like. The artichoke? Yeah, I didn't like that. Yeah. You also didn't... I mean, there's lots of stuff giving you that you didn't like. But was that the worst? That's just the first one. That, it's the one that pops in my head. I can still remember the seat. I was in... The window was to my back on the seat that I was sitting in mm -hmm. um, on Zhang. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what else have you given me that I didn't like? Um, one time, both of our wives and I convinced you to eat some canned tuna. Oh, I did not like that. <laughs> yeah, you weren't a fan of that. <laughs> didn't you guys try to trick me? You tricked me and told me it wasn't canned tuna. Uh, no, no. Because I, I don't like canned tuna, but I don't like canned tuna out of the principle. Like, I've never tried it, so I don't know if I like <laughs> it type of thing. Because it, like, smells weird, and my mom used to eat it when I was little, so I have, like, an association right. of, oh, that's gross, like, as a little kid. And I feel like you guys, like, put it on something and, like, didn't tell me it was canned and, tuna, and I ate it. I was like, this is trash. <laughs> there and is... you guys are like, oh, my God, it's for real. Which, and it's funny, too, because, like, you like, like, tuna tuna. Like, I like tuna. Like, sushi and stuff. Oh, know? yeah. Um, and to me, it's like, I mean, it's not the same, but it's similar. But yeah. anyways, that's hilarious. I was thinking there was something, same thing, back in my old house. We were eating dinner there one time, and you started choking. And, again, our wives were freaking out, like, oh, and I was like, I got it. I'm gonna I'm like this dude. I remember that. <laughs> you remember yeah. that? What, what was it? I can't remember, but if you said that food, that would make sense to me. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, okay. I don't remember what it um, was. But yeah, you Heimlich me. This wasn't one of the uh... Neither of us were like concerned. Yeah, you were just like Ugh. I was like, <laughs> 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 I was like, yeah, get me. Get I got me. you, bro. Well you know what's funny <laughs> is literally that day. I just happened to redo my first aid training for because I have uh, my CSCS, right? Yeah, yeah. And part of that is you have to stay up to date on your you know, yeah. CPR, AD, first aid, all that kind of stuff. Literally that day, I just refreshed it. And I was like, I got it. I got it. I'm not even remotely concerned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was good. Um, So, again, this wasn't one of the questions, but I just thought of this as a follow up. What's the best food I've ever made you taste? Dude, honestly, so. I've had a lot of really good food with you, mm -hmm. right? Especially with like Marissa's cooking yeah. and stuff. But I'm not going to count anything Marissa has made okay. because I That's don't want to count it. Okay, you made a sandwich that we ate on the loading dock of twenty oh, of, yeah. of when we were when we were building out the gym. Uh huh. So when we were building out uh, when we were moving from twenty twenty Smallman, which was above Peace Love and Little Donuts, and we mm -hmm. moved down a couple blocks to to uh, 17th Street. Above the costume shop, yeah. 1600 small men above the costume world. We were like building it out and we were like getting dumpsters through the middle of the night. So we were like, Will and I and some other people here and there would be doing demo through the middle of the night. Yeah. So that way we could get these dumpsters without a permit. <laughs> <laughs> and we were on the loading dock and you gave me half of your sandwich. It was just like... Dumb fire. It I'm was crazy. Not gonna lie, I'm I'm not good at making a lot of food, but the food you make I'm good sick at, omelets too. Dude, I make great eggs, good steak, and I'm nice with making sandwiches. Dude, Sammy, this is where you shine. That's that was a good pick, and also, yeah, you can't. I don't remember. What, I just remember like it, like like never eat something and it like hits the roof of your mouth yeah. and like you get a little like 
I got all kinds of good tips, you know what I mean? Like you have to take the mustard and the mayonnaise right to the edge. Like otherwise every bite isn't consistent. That's from my dad. You've got to have the right amount of lettuce. Just the ratios are really important. Yeah. And like a lot of people just do one meat. Sometimes I'll do a meat and like a little bit of salami just to, you know, kind of mix it up. Yeah. I know my cheeses, you know, like I'm You do know your cheeses. I mix the right flavors. Yeah. That's a good answer. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on. Those were sick uh, questions. I like this. (laughs) My favorite thing about this is like I didn't have to do any prep. And the prep for me was relatively easy. I thought of a couple questions and then I was like, hey, what do you guys got? (laughs) All right, let's move on. From Mr. Lonnie Howard. Oh, no. First question. He's got a bunch of questions. Um, Actually, you know what? I lied. I'm going to go out of order here because his first one kind of piggybacks on this. What's your favorite meal to eat after watching your soldiers gain victory in battle? Favorite meal? Wings. Wings. Exactly what I thought you were going to say. Yeah, I want wings after. We've been known to hit a B-dubs after. Oh, the yeah. I'm going to hit a B-dubs. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Wings. <laughs> Can't go wrong with wings. Yep. All right. Lonnie asked, how is it basically being the grandpa of high rollers? What? <laughs> that's his question. Dude, the high rollers got me. <laughs> I was at high rollers and I struggled. <laughs> they needed to help me. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to coach Dempsey and I couldn't stand up. I was like, no. Uh, it feels good. Like the high rollers has been such like a, it's been such a success, right? Yeah. Like you hear it on the Rogan podcast. Mm-hmm. I'll hear it. I hear it like randomly on like other podcasts and they'll be like oh yeah high rollers oh and they talk about like cops versus stoners mm-hmm. and stuff and they're like yeah you have to compete high and they're like what about the cops and they're like well not them but yeah. like it helps like you know like with like the um adopt the cop thing like Mitch, yeah. Mitch Agua Ag, I want to say oh I always pronounce his last name's not the easiest to pronounce it's gotcha. like Aguire yeah. or whatever um I don't know dude but like it's so cool and like Whenever I hear it, like people talking about it, like you ever like listen to a radio show or a podcast and they're like saying something and like you just are like want to be like, no, it's this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like every time like something comes up high rollers, I want to be like, oh, Lonnie. Uh, exactly. Like, you know, yeah. It's also cool because like I remember Lonnie telling me, he's like, yo, I got this idea for a tournament. I'm going to mix oh, my yeah, two favorite things. Oh, yeah, before it happened. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, all right, dude, like this sounds pretty much impossible. And the next thing you know. He's making it happen, and it's huge. Yeah. And he's, you know, I mean, they don't have it anymore, but they had that space in Vegas. They had Kimbo's yeah. Cage. Like, yeah. I think we're going to look back on those events in, like, 20 years and be like, dude, we were right at the start of it. You yeah. Know? Like, just yeah. getting to see it grow like that. Now it does, they do wrestling now. Yeah, too. yeah. Which, actually, is a great segue. I've got some more, uh, some more questions from Lonnie. Who are your top six wrestlers ever? Top six wrestlers ever? My number mm-hmm. one is John Smith. Okay. Because of USA. So John Smith, uh, six in a row, world and Olympic champ, um, <clears throat> 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. Uh, and they went right into coaching, coach Fantastic Oklahoma coach. State. I was a revolutionary wrestler too. Um, he was credited for the low single, mm-hmm. which like, it's crazy to think that like before him, no one shot below the knee. That's so wild. You know, it's just yeah. like wrestling's <laughs> been around forever. <laughs> Literally for And no, everybody was like, yeah, you know, why would you grab down here? You know? Um, and, and like his his style was so, I, I like it passed the eye test. It was right. like very like smooth and yeah. slick, and it like looked cool and uh-huh. s- like s- yeah. So he's my number one. My number two. This would be take us international. Uh, Besik Kudakov. Okay. Um, Are you telling me about him? Yeah, he actually passed away in a car accident mm-hmm. while still like yeah in was, wrestling right. mode. Um, yeah. Uh, in a car accident. Um, he had a great rivalry with actually Henry Cejudo, like in the juniors and everything. Um, Henry, I've heard Henry talk about him, and Henry was actually like going to name his son Be- Besic. Oh, wow. Was, like, yeah, I was like, after my best ri- my my greatest rival or wow, that's what whatever. Doing. Yeah, and it's like, dude, it's like, yeah, it's pretty intense. But he was crazy entertaining to watch, so I encourage you to look up some some film on him. Um, we'll bring it back stateside and we'll go with Kale. Great choice. Kale. So Kale, like, you know, just like greatest co- collegiate wrestler ever. The only person to go undefeated and win four mm-hmm. at time of filming. There's only five four time champs, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and he's the only one who's done it while being undefeated, which is crazy. Cause it's you think of like all these greats yeah, 
And it's like, yeah, like Kyle Dake's got like three or four losses. David Taylor's mm-hmm. got three losses. And like all these dudes, like everybody's got losses. Like all the four-timers, like I said, they all got losses. Didn't uh, Gable lose his last match? Yeah, Gable lost his last match. He lost to Larry Owings. Another unique stat about Gable <clears throat> is back in that time, you weren't able to compete as a freshman. So you only got mm. three years of competition. Your freshman year... You, you weren't allowed to compete until your sophomore year. So he went undefeated uh, sophomore, junior, and senior up until the NCAA finals. Uh, and then he lost to Larry Owings. Dude, going undefeated in wrestling is just... It's so mind-blowing. Dan Gable was also undefeated in high school. That's... Dude, that's insane. And then he won the 1971 Worlds and the 1972 Olympics. And in the 1972 Olympics, he didn't give up a single point. That's Okay, that's the other stat I was just thinking about. Another that's crazy thing about the 1972 Olympics, they were in Munich and then there was a terrorist attack on the Olympic Village. And after he won the gold medal, he was being interviewed and they were like, oh, da 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 like, how did it feel like, like with the attack? How did you stay focused and stuff? And he was like, what? He had no idea. Yeah, he was like, what? He was just so dialed in. He was like, what happened? (laughs) They're like, yeah, dude, there was a terrorist attack, like, on your building. And he was like, what? (laughs) He was so dialed in to, like, win in gold that, like, he didn't even know. That's crazy. He was, like, held hostage. He didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just a unique story. And, like, I don't know how exactly 100%. I, like, I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's been freaking... A long time. It's a legend, dude. Let's let it be a legend. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But it's like a story that I've been told. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. All right, so you're at three. I'm at three. That's Kale. So then after Kale, I'm going to have to go with who I believe is actually the greatest wrestler of all time. And that's going to be Muvsar Satyev. Satyev. He's my favorite wrestler. Okay, yeah. I mean, so he uh, wrestled in four Olympics and he won three of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Now with the Olympics being every four years, that's quite a length of time yeah you know he's he he debuted in the uh 96 olympics and he also he debuted and won the 96 olympics and he also won the 2008 olympics and you could see like a change in him throughout it all like he's like this like young kid and then he's gray hair yeah. grizzled um and his style changed for every olympic right. you know right. what i mean like and one he's like all over hooks and loosey goosey. The other one, he's shooting explosively. Like you know, the next one, he's counter attacks. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, so like reinventing his style, and also he wrestled under two rule sets, which we'll talk about when we get to my five. Okay. Um, he wrestled under two different rule sets, and like certain rule sets favor certain styles or right. people. So to win under both shows some That's, completeness yeah, over your, over the art. And he was definitely better than his brother, right? What did his brother yeah, do? Yeah, Adam. Mm-hmm. So there were years where uh, he didn't wrestle in the world championships mm-hmm. because he let his brother wrestle because they were the same weight. Mm. Um, and then later on, his brother went up a weight class and was like notably small, like looked right. like, like, whoa, dude. And actually, his brother, Adam Satiev, beat Yoel Romero in the world finals. That's and you all remember, that's remember like they, you look at them and you're like, what? These yeah, two you're are like, no wrestling way. each other? They're not even close to the same size. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I love them because they're so technical. It's just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. All right, so that's they're like four. loose and soft and bang. Yeah, yeah. Loose and I love soft. that. Bang. That's what tells me I think they would have been good strikers too. You know? Oh, I'm sure of it. Yeah. I'm sure of it. Yeah. So that's four. So number four. five, huh? So that's four. Yeah. Yeah. Number five. I'm gonna run it back state side. Let's go, JB. All I see is okay. gold. Okay. Okay. Great choice. Jordan Burroughs. Jordan Burroughs also won under two different rule sets, mm-hmm. so he pretty much picked up where Satiev left, left off. So he won under the last role set Satiev won in, which was called known as the ball draw era. And it was the worst. It sucked so bad. So the way they did it, it kind of like MMA fights, where it was like by period. So like mm. if you beat me 1-0 in the first period, and then I beat you 5-0 in the second period, and you beat me 1-0 in the third period, who won the match? On paper, it's going to be me. Yeah, you won because but, you won two periods to but one. But who had more points? Even though I scored, it was yeah. five to two. That's ridiculous. Know? So, yeah, that sucked. And if the period ended in a draw, they would do they would go to this bag. And in this bag, we each have a singlet on. You have a blue singlet. Mm-hmm. I have a red singlet. In the bag, there were two balls each. In, there were four balls in the bag, two mm-hmm. blue, two red. And you would reach in and you'd pull the ball out, right? So, the theory was, all right, I pulled a blue ball out. Now, we start in this position called the clinch 
Now what the clinch is, is you, I stand there with my arms open and you come in and you're going to get a single leg. And as mm. soon as it's like locked, it's on. Yeah. Right. It's like, boom, boom. Right. And I, like whoever takes the leg has to finish. Yeah. And whoever's defense just has to like not get taken down. Right. Right. Now the person who took the leg, it was like 95% success rate. Mm-hmm. Right. So basically it came down to like, if your color got pulled out, it basically yeah. you won. Now, the way that they tried to rationalize it is, well, there's two balls of each in there. Mm-hmm. So if we go to the ball draw in the first period and you pull out a blue ball, well, now we go to the ball draw again. Well, now there's two of mine and right. only one of yours, you know? So then it would be like weighted in my favor because there's two of mine. So like, but yeah, but um, it was just a stupid rule set. Um, it let people wrestle for tie. Like like people would like, if you, it, it, what it incentivized, if you were not the better wrestler. Mm-hmm. It incentivized you not to wrestle. Right. Right? So if I'm like, damn, Will's a better wrestler than me, I'm just going to stall this. Because then if I go to the ball and I get my ball, that's my chance of winning. Exactly. You know? And then the new era now is cumulative scoring two periods. Mm -hmm. And it's just like how you would imagine wrestling should be. Like you just score points. Dude. And they go on the scoreboard. That's crazy. I had no idea that that system existed. Yeah. That's wild. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, so that's number five. That's number five. Number six. So this is tough because I'm going to have to put on my last. It's the last one. Oh, sheesh. And then there's so many good like wrestlers to choose from. I feel like I'm going to be sad no matter what. Whoever I leave off. Man. Ah, dang. I almost don't want to do it because it's the last <laughs> spot. And I'm struggling. So I got Satyev. Kudakov. I got three Americans on there. I don't know. Uh, I'm just going to have to throw a shot out there. And I'm going to go with David Taylor. It's also a great pick. So David Taylor, uh, he's current right now. Mm-hmm. And he's the most dominant world champion right now. Like, And he has such a heavy attack rate. Mm-hmm. So, so I really like that. He's just like always on the offense, heavy attack rate. He's also keeping someone else from being a goat. Mm-hmm. So there's um, Hassan Yazdani Charati, yep. who won the two, 2016 Olympics that Jordan Burroughs was in. Jordan mm-hmm. Burroughs lost that one. And basically, so Hassan Yazdani Charati, he made his senior level debut. I was at the Worlds in 2015. He made it at 70 kilograms. In 2014, he was the junior world championship at 66 kilograms. The next year, senior world runner up at 70 kilograms. The next year, Olympic champ at 74 kilograms. The next year, world champ at 86 kilos and he won it every year up until 2018 so just the very next year david taylor won it and then in 2019 david taylor tore his acl so he didn't go Uh uh-huh yes donnie won it again then 2020 the olympics that happened Mm -hmm. in 2021 david taylor won then in 2021 yes donnie beat david taylor those matches were only 10 weeks apart yeah that happened right yeah back and then the past two years david taylor's just stopped on him Dude, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so that was a tough list to make. Um, I, I mean, I have like personal favorites in there, like like you know people who like, sh- like you know like so like Jordan Oliver. He wrestled at Oklahoma State. He's from he's a PA kid, three time state champ for Easton. Uh, the only year he didn't win a state title was his freshman year, and um, he was super undersized for the, he was like 90 pounds wrestling yeah. 103 and stuff, but like very like fun to watch wrestle mm-hmm. two time NCAA champion, um, arguably three, there's a new role created because of him mm-hmm. and stuff. So like, you know, like that's it, like a part, but like, obviously he's not going to be right. anybody on that list, but it was like, just like a personal preference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's cool. I think that's a good list though. My list wasn't the list of the greatest, although kind of like, yeah, it's a little bit of both, a little bit of that, right. a little bit of what you yeah. like. Yeah. yeah, yeah just I mean, like what I like. That's, uh, that's what the question is, you know? Yeah. So I actually suggest, like, those of you who may be interested, look up some of those names on the list, especially if you're not familiar with it, especially the, the, the two Russians on the yeah. list. Give them, a, give them a look. All right. Uh, we might come back to some other of Lonnie's questions. Um, let's jump. You know what? I'm going to hit you with another fun one here. Mike, can you name any of the plants on the wall behind you? Any of the plants? Do you know what any of these are? No. <laughs> you want to no. take any guesses? A ficus? <laughs> no, you're not anywhere close. I do have a ficus out there, but no. Dude, I don't know. Just, it's not, I know, like... This what, I don't expect you to get. This, this is, is the only one I think I would get. Like, 
Really? Uh, this is the hardest one. Yeah, but like, I don't know. I, it's like, looks normal. It's got leaves. This is a pothos. Okay, I wouldn't get that. What's that one? This one you should get, dude. For real? A cactus? Dude, this know. is an aloe vera plant. This okay. is what you get when like you have like a like a burn. We I just saw like it's got like little spikies on it, so I was like, maybe it's a form of something. I don't know. Nah, but yeah, nah. okay, I see what you're saying. That's an aloe, so if you get burnt, we'll yeah, dude, I don't know this. Don't and know that this is a very oh, there's another one over there. That's a variation of an aloe. I don't think it's like aloe vera, like the same thing. It's Whatever, like a little thing. Um. <laughs> dude, I don't know. That was a bad question. I, don't know. I enjoyed it. Um, let's bounce around back to some fighter questions here. Um, Let's get one from, maybe even a couple from Will here. Um, let's start. With, yeah, all right. He's actually going to good Will order. Tim? Will Tim, yes. Um, Mr. Mittens? Mr. Mittens. <laughs> what alcohol should a fighter drink that won't affect his weight? Oh, wine. <laughs> okay. Do you have yeah. a reason for that? Well, so this is not advice. <laughs> this is not advice. I don't want anybody to follow this. But I had a theory where, like, I wouldn't, like, let, like, fighting impact my life. (laughs) So I drank beer. (laughs) The whole fight camp. The Donald Cowboy Cerrone method. (laughs) Yeah. Bad idea. But I regret it. But whatever. I did it. And then the Wednesday, or sometimes I would start the Monday before the fight, but the Wednesday, because I had to cut weight. Thursday night to weigh in Fridays. Thursday night, I would start my weight cut for Friday. Mm-hmm. So Wednesday night, I would switch to wine. <laughs> <laughs> not not Dude, medical bro, advice. Not no, even good advice Not good at all. advice at all. <laughs> but that's your answer. You know what's well. crazy? Like, yeah. I drank significantly less retired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did fighting. It's funny because Significantly. like when you're fighting you're like young and everything and like that's when you know you want to be drinking and then you get a little older and you're like eh, drinking's not yeah, that I'm awesome. Yeah, like not you know? that into it. And you're like oh man I wish I could have reversed that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Alright here's another question from Will. During a fighter's camp is it important not to over practice and burn yourself out or is it important to go hard the whole time? It's important not to over practice and burn yourself out, but also I think it's important to find that line. Mm-hmm. So especially like that's what your amateur career and even to some extent your early pro career is for is for you to find that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So like it's hard to overtrain. I think people may think they're over like when overtraining became like a thing like, oh, it's real. Right. That's a real thing. I think people started associating it with being tired being tired and stuff and I'm like dude you're not overtrained yeah you're not overtrained like also, it's hard to overtrain I think you that, can yeah but like for it, sure it's hard and I don't think like I think um we've only we haven't experienced a lot of it in right. our and out on our team yeah um someone who I could think of like I think Brittany overtrained yeah there were definitely times where I would have to tell um, us. Especially with, like, it depends on what your outside job is also. So, okay, this is kind of the point I was going to get at is I think that something that's way more common than overtraining is under-recovering, you know? Okay, yeah. And so, like, you know, me, for example, I'm not good at sleeping, right? One, I just, like, I don't sleep that well. Two, I just happen to, like, I know this is, the reason why I think this is funny is because on fight trips, I was known to just, like, you fall asleep sleep. all the time. You sleep. You just, like, <laughs> sleep. And I don't ever sleep. Like, I don't sleep. We'll be on fight trips. Mike will sleep for, like, six, seven hours and be like, all right, I'm good. And I'll sleep yeah, for, like, nine hours and be like, dude, I'm so tired. Go take a nap. I could be so mad. I'm like, no, you're not. Wake up. But especially more recently, I, I don't sleep as well, especially not as well as I used to. And and also, it's my own fault. Like, I'll stay up late doing fun stuff because I got fun stuff to do. You know yeah. what I mean? And my own fault. But, you know, does that mean... Like that, I'm overtrained because I can only train like you know once a day or something. No, nah, it's because I'm under recovered. You know what I mean? So that was I a good question. That's that's more common. Yeah, that's a good question. He's got one more. This one's fun. Could an MMA fighter beat a Navy SEAL in hand to hand combat? Yeah. Yes, and I think the answer is also pretty easily. Yeah. Now, is that Navy SEAL also an MMA fighter? Like, you know what I mean? Could a, a Navy SEAL beat an MMA fighter in hand to hand combat? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Who it is. But I'd say, like, generally, Mm -hmm. like, it's what we do. Yeah. I've heard this a lot, actually, from people, like, outside of fighting. They're like, oh, bro, but, like, these guys, you see them in the cage. Like, they're good and everything, but they could never beat a Navy SEAL. They train for real. And I'm like, what do you mean? 
And they're like, oh, you know, they, they train for like like real life stuff. I'm like, yeah, and they're training for like yeah, with and guns. we're training for fighting. Yeah. Exactly. Specificity is We're key. training for what you're asking the question for. Exactly. And these you dudes know? have to know how to gunfight. They have to know how to jump out of planes. They need to know how to scuba dive. They need to know how to, like, you know, uh, evade em- enemy forces. Right. They need to know how to survive in different trains. Like, there's so much they have to learn. In MMA as a sport, there's so much to learn. And now you're saying that these dudes who have to learn all kinds of other stuff at a high level are also going to be... It's exactly what we argue. Like, it's like, okay, like, can an M- Like, why it's, like, not logical for an MMA fighter to be the best at their discipline, Mm -hmm. like in that specialty, right? Like, it's like, oh, it's like, dude, this guy's the best jujitsu guy um, in MMA, like Charles Oliveira. Like, how would he do at ADCCs? Probably lose. Yeah. (laughs) Probably lose. Why? Because these guys specialize in it. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? And he can't because he's got to work on his striking and, and, and other stuff. And like, same thing, who's the best boxer in MMA? You know, it's like, okay, like... Yeah, maybe Dustin or Dustin, Max right? Holloway. Or... All right, how uh, how would he do at, at, in a world title fight right. against whoever's in his weight class? Probably lose. Yeah. You know, because he's got to work on his kicks and his takedowns and his jujitsu. Mm-hmm. So these Navy SEALs, they got to work on all that other stuff. And <clears throat> when do they retire from being Navy SEALs? SEALs? That's a good question. I want to say there's some of them who make it into their early 40s, I believe. Oh, okay, okay. I think so. But well, I was not... thinking if they retired in their like twenties or even like early thirties, sure why wouldn't they jump? Do. Yeah, why wouldn't they jump in and be UFC champ then? Yeah, if for it's real. so easy, right? Yeah, yeah, if exactly. It's so easy. If that training just carries right. The other over. thing I like to say on this, it's like, like I don't care what you have done, like you know what I mean. It's like what you're doing. Like if you're gonna get better at something you practice, right? Mm-hmm. So when you tell me like something about like. Like, someone's like, oh, you know, I think I might be able to hang with you in a fight. And I'm like, why? Why Why would you think that? If I was like, hey, Will, here goes what we're going to do. We're going to meet up every morning at 10 a.m. and every night at 7 p.m. And we're going to spend an hour and a half to two hours sliding a paper football across this table. (laughs) Slide it across the table. Slide it across the table. Slide it. We're going to get pretty good. Yeah. If uh, you watching, if you practice sliding a paper football across the desk like you used to do, across the lunch table, yep. right? Like you used to do in school, right? If you practice that for 10 to 14 hours a week, do you think you would be better after five years of that than you were when you started? Like, obviously, dude. Yeah. Obviously. Like, come on, man. So, dumb question, just dumb. Or yeah. not dumb question. Right, like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's like dumb. dumb premise, yeah. I've, dumb I've heard premise. that before too, like where, you know, someone who like, you know, just finds out what I do or whatever and they go, oh yeah, you know, I feel like I'd be good at that. And I'm like, why? Like, what makes you, that's like me like showing up to someone who's like an accountant and be like, oh dude, I'd be nice with the spreadsheets. Well, I don't think I would be, you know, so <laughs> Well, I mean, look, yeah, you're good with numbers. I'll be real but, with you. But like. I'd be a great accountant. I feel like people people see fighting as like a visceral thing and they're like, oh yeah, like I could fight someone if I had to. It's like, yeah, you could fight someone. That doesn't mean you can do it well. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, I could jump in some spreadsheets and start doing some accounting, but like I'm not going to do it as well as someone who's been, you know, yeah. maybe accounting is not a good example. No, no, no. I just was like, any it's funny because I love spreadsheets right, and, and numbers, numbers. Yeah. and I love doing things repetitively. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but like no matter what someone's like profession is, if you do that all the time, even if I'm naturally like, good at whatever that is yeah Yeah, exactly like i'm not going to be as good as you are from practicing all the time and fighting is just a skill like you're not going to be as good yeah so yeah great answer great answer all right that's all of will's questions let me uh let me bounce around i'm gonna hit you with uh i've actually used up a lot of my questions um because we discussed this on a previous podcast i'm gonna i'm gonna throw this out here this is a me question what are your thoughts on mixed rules fights? So think, for example, Rod Tank, Demetrius Johnson, or I think Mickey they're Holskin. dumb. I think they're dumb. dumb Why is fight. that? Well, because it's just like, you know, is it even fair? People are like, oh, well, we'll do one round of your fight, one round of my fight. Who goes first? Okay, but that's that's just the recent examples of it we've seen. There's also mixed rules fights, for example, um, when, uh, oh, what's his name, in- Inoki, I think, fought uh, Muhammad Ali in a mixed rules fight. What were the rules? Um, I believe it was... I forget what the rules were. To be honest, I think it was similar to modern MMA with a couple adjustments. Um, Here's my thing. With mixed rules fights, we have them. and we have, We've perfected mixed rules fights. It's called MMA, where you can mix any rule set you want. Oh, you want to do your kickboxing? Legal. 
You want to do your jujitsu? Legal. You want to do your wrestling? Legal. You want to do your Muay Thai? Legal. You want to do whatever you do. Like, you can do it here, right? So why are we like, oh, you know what? Let's just do boxing for round one. Then we'll do kickboxing for round two. And then and then MMA for round three. Like, why are we doing that? Okay, so I, I totally get your point. But as someone who enjoys mixed rules fights and just like kind of like freak show. Not freak show, but like different sorts of things. Um, what are your thoughts on like then... Because you could make an argument that like, oh, kickboxing shouldn't exist because it's just like a modified version of Muay Thai. Why not I agree. Just the most per- permissive thing. I agree. Kickboxing shouldn't exist. Or boxing for that matter. Because no, kickboxing. boxing should exist. But see, that's the thing is boxing is really cool because we get to see a specialization of that thing. Same thing with kickboxing. It's like we get to see a lot of the good stuff from Muay Thai, but it's at a way faster pace because you know, we don't have to worry about the clinch and, you know, taking away the elbows allows for a little bit more like dynamic work on the inside. Okay. Yeah, I'm sold on that. All right. <laughs> but I just don't like when the rules change round around. Round around. Yeah. yeah. See, I love it, but I totally get what you're saying too. Yeah. I'm not a fan, but like, whatever. Like, if you, like, I don't want, I'm not like, bar it. Yeah, yeah. You know? You're not going to petition the uh, athletic yeah. commission and be like, don't have this on a card. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's whatever. I'm just like, not into it. All right, let's move on to, uh, all right, this is a good question. This one is from Joao Martinez. Has right. Mike ever considered starting a wrestling program at Style, and what would it be like if he did? For example, folk style, freestyle, or Greco? Yes, I've considered it. Um, we were going to do it in the past. Um, it would be all three, st- it would be, no, it would not, we wouldn't do much Greco. Maybe we'd dabble in it, but like, I just don't feel comfortable enough to be teaching mm-hmm. uh, Greco. Um, but like folks on freestyle, I feel fairly comfortable yeah. teaching like kids, like, you know what yeah, I mean? Like yeah, I'm not yeah. like, like, I, like I'm not trying to like, you know, have someone trying to make the world team be like, Hey, can you coach me? Like, no, dude, I can't come <laughs> yeah. can't coach you. Can you no. coach me? <laughs> yeah, dude. No, no. But like, you know, like youth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so here goes what I'd have to say on why we don't. I think there's a lot of better options mm-hmm. than me around. Um, so like what I'm saying is like the competitive space we would be in, in this area is incredibly competitive. Mm -hmm. And like, dude, if I'm going to be honest with you, like if I started a club and I have a son who ideally will be wrestling within the next five years or so, Mm -hmm. he's three. So like, you know, sometime around like six to 10 or whatever, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Haven't figured it out really. Um, I'd probably set like. If I think of the clubs around, I'm probably going to send them. Like, even if I had my own, I'd be like, you're going to go to that club. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, there's the Mad Factory. There's Young Guns. There's OMP. There's Quest. There's South Hills Wrestling Academy. Um, You know what I mean? There's just, like, a lot of, like... People who specialize there's, in There's clubs. That. Dude, and this is just literally right here. And there's clubs that, like, I don't even know of. Like, mm-hmm. so my cousin's wrestling right now. He's in seventh grade. And they're talking about clubs. And I'm like... Shh, I don't know that club. They're like, oh, yeah, it's in Kiski or something. I'm like, really? (laughs) I have no idea. Right? And they're good. Right, yeah. And they're better than me. So, like, just go do that. Like, so, like, it's like, you know, and then on top of it, what would it take away from what we are good at? Exactly. You know, like, I'm good at, we are good at Mm jujitsu. We are good at Muay Thai. We are good at MMA. Mm -hmm. Right? So, like, why would I take my focus off of that to do something I'm less qualified to do? especially compared to my peers mm-hmm. around, right. you know? So yeah, just doesn't make re- a lot of sense, but it is something that I would love to do. And I'll probably get back into coaching and wrestling yeah. in some capacity as like my, my, my kids get into it. Yeah. I'll probably get sucked back in. I, I coached wrestling for Quite eight, eight seasons. I did eight seasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of coaching wrestling. That's a good answer. Yeah. Um, all right. This next question comes from Hugo. All right. He wants to know, what's better for developing skills during sparring? Being the hammer or being the nail? Being the hammer. I Interesting. I have... Let's expand on what you're thinking first. Just, I mean, just, I don't know what it's like to be the nail. <laughs> okay, well, hold on. Let me let me offer some, some perspective here. And I think that when we say sparring, oftentimes we think about like just like MMA sparring or like stand-up sparring and stuff. Um, and I think that the same thing applies, but I'm going to use a jiu-jitsu example. When you are, you know, let's say you're like a purple belt and you're only going with black belts. 
your defense is going to get a lot better a lot faster. Whereas if you're only going with white belts, your offense is going to get a lot better a lot faster. So my argument would be the same thing applies in, you know, stand-up sparring or, you know, regular sparring, whatever. Um, And so you need a little bit of both. Right, but that wasn't an option. (laughs) That wasn't an option. Um, The thing I would argue against, and if you only have to choose one, I'd say you want to be the hammer because if you're the nail too much, you're giving up some brain cells that uh, are better spent in a fight. So... uh, now, being the nail, maybe what you have to do to earn your time is the hammer. Mm-hmm. You know, there's also like it's not just about what's best for you; it's how do you get to do what's best for you? Mm-hmm. How do you earn to do what's best for you? And if you're not the hammer right off the bat, you don't deserve to be, mm-hmm. right? Like you don't deserve to be the hammer. Yeah, you know, um, you got to work your way up to it. Like I use this like so with jujitsu a lot of times. Someone new starts, right? And, like, you know, like, people new start every day. And, like, sometimes they come in in, like, groups or whatever. And, but, like, the people who start at roughly around the same time, they're in, like, this, like, class, mm-hmm. right? Like, and I'm not talking about, like, they're in fundamentals class on Tuesday. I'm talking about, like, like oh, cl- class of 09. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like, kind of like that. Like, so you all start around the same time. And you're all the nail. Right? And when do you become the hammer? Well, your first taste of the hammer is a bunch of new people just signed up. Yep. <laughs> Here we go. Right? And then, like, then you progress at certain rates. Some progress faster, some progress lower. And honestly, just through, like, through endurance, you shall conquer. Mm-hmm. That's, like, how you get to being the hammer most of the time. Now, a better question should be how do you learn as the hammer? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, like, that's tough. It sure it's is. tough because like, you know, like, especially if you're identifying with winning, right. right? It takes a good nail, so to speak, to learn as being a hammer. And I don't mean good as in skilled. I mean, I do mean that. Yeah. But I mean like, okay, so like, or like you to be truly able to drop your ego better. So like, for example, let's say we're grappling and I'm trying to get better mm-hmm. at grappling and I'm better than you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're doing our rounds and I'm beating you in our rounds. I'm beating you in our rounds. And I'm like, okay, well, I need to get better at certain things. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to play top half because I know Will has a good scorpion hook. Mm-hmm. So that way it gives him the opportunity to play where he is good. Right. You know? So that's where we're closest competitive. Mm-hmm. So I should use you there. Right. And then sometimes because I should be trying, like, putting myself in positions that give you an advantage because now I'm making you closer to me. Right. So I'm making it more competitive mm-hmm. for me. And then I'm able to get better at skills that I can't get better at normally when I roll with you. Yeah, I can get better at my offensive skills. So I'm just mm-hmm. crushing you, crushing you. But if I want to get better at my defensive skills, I have to allow you offensive opportunities. And if I'm allowing that, that means I'm allowing you advantages over me. And if I'm allowing you advantages over me, that means I'm putting us in positions where you're the hammer and I'm the nail. Right. That comes with getting beat. So can I temper my ego to where if you beat me, I'm fine? That's number one. Number two, how do you behave as the nail? Yeah. Do you celebrate and beat your chest? Yeah. Do you post a video of it on Instagram? Do you go tell everybody in the locker room, I arm barred Mike today. I guillotined Mike today. I heel hooked Mike today. Right? Like, are you out there like doing that? Like celebrating these training victories? Well, then that might make it more difficult for me to check my ego. Mm -hmm. And now you're not the right nail for me. Yeah. If I can still check my ego through that, then I'm, I'm, I'm a special person, but I would struggle to check my ego in that situation. Definitely. Right. I'd have to be like, well, and I think everybody listening, if you put yourself in that place, you'd be like, yep, whooping his ass. You know what I mean? (laughs) And that's typically what happens. Typically what happens is if I were to experience that, I come back whoop your ass yep. and I do it bad I yeah. stomp a hole in you yep. you know what I mean and then maybe I try again maybe I'm like okay hey like this is for you mm-hmm. like like you know like realize I can stomp you at any time mm-hmm. like I'm, this is both of us this is also you as the nail yeah. who doesn't get to get better up now I'm giving you like this is best for both us both exactly you know don't ruin it yeah, yeah you, you know respect my, where I, do, I do have an ego mm-hmm. and like it takes hits and I react accordingly. You know what I mean? Like I'm not this egoless person. Like, and I think that's totally fair too. You know, like if you, you know, if you, let's say you're having a sparring round and you're like, Hey, I'm better than this guy. Uh, let me focus on something I'm not good at. Let me just try to land. Like, I don't know, a, uh, a particular body shot setup or something. Yeah. You keep trying the same thing, trying the same thing. Maybe you show it two or three times and the guy starts figuring out and he cracks you with like a big right hand and it goes and tells everyone about it. And you're like, 
nah, like you got to know now. <laughs> With that being said, though, you also have to give them real rounds too. So like I wouldn't only use you like by giving you advantage mm -hmm. positions because then I'm never giving you the opportunity to truly beat me. Right. Right. So, like, how many times have you done something you're like, man, I did really well with that person and it gave you confidence. Right. Right? And it allowed you to level up. So, if I never give you, yeah. like, my, a true, ch like, if I never, like, if I only, like, let you do arm bars to work out and let you put, let you get your scorpion hook on the workout and let you do this, then I'm never giving you the chance to build your confidence, right. too. So, like, I do also need to, like, have times where I'm, like, giving you my A game. Yeah, for sure. And, and giving you a, ch like, so that That's way you have a chance. barometer for where you. So you have the chance to fight that A game. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a give, there's so much give and take in combat sports training. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's why it's tough to, like, have good teammates. So a lot of people have certain teammates for certain things. Mm -hmm. As coaches, we do that, right? Definitely. It's like, okay, it's like, all right, this person needs this kind of a round. You're going to go with. Yeah, exactly. A. Oh, you need this kind of round. You're going to go with B. You know, that's one of the values I think that we have with such a big team with a big team is you and have that. Yeah. Something that I think we've done a really good job of with our big team is that like we've curated like really, really good, um, like cooperative. Uh, yeah. Know, um, that's what I'm looking for here, like vibes, I guess. Mm -hmm. And everyone's, you know, trying to get better together. And, and right. We're, I think we're doing because like, the, the teammates have responsibility for others improvements exactly. as well, which is great because it gives you a little bit of like a coaching hat, which coaching helps you understand. Exactly. So I think there's a lot of positives to it. Now, there's also negatives to it. Definitely. Like the negative to the to the big team is I cannot give everybody as much of attention as if there was only five of you mm -hmm. when there's 30 of you. Yep. Like I can only, I only, there's only have so much like literal I've only time. so much literal time and then only so much like energy in my bucket. Mental ability. Yeah. yeah. You know, so there are negatives there mm -hmm, for sure as well. So I'm not trying to say like, Oh yeah, it's the this best the way. way. Yeah. yeah no. No, there's different ways for sure. Good answer. There's lots of nuance in there. All right. We're, uh, how are we doing on time? Let's get down to the last couple here. Um, Okay, uh, let's start with this one then. This one comes from James Padmore. He uh, said, I just want Mike to break down his definition of being a grappler. For example, would a person be a grappler because they're just good at jiu-jitsu? Or are you a good grappler because you can do all grappling forms, such as wrestling, jiu-jitsu, judo, etc.? Okay, so my definition, I'm not saying this is right, but when I say a good grappler, I mean all grappling forms. Mm-hmm. Because you can be a good wrestler right. and be shitty at jujitsu. Yeah. You can be good at jujitsu and be shitty at grappling. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? For sure. So a good grappler means that, and also like MMA is involved in that too. You could be good at wrestling and jujitsu, but then when strikes are involved, you're mid, mm -hmm. right? So a good grappler, when I say good grappler, it speaks to the um, the the, the well-roundedness. Yeah, the completeness of the that. The completeness yeah. of grappling and that was a phenomenal question. Yeah, and I think that's that's important too. I look at it the same way as, as with the when word you say striking. striker. Yeah, exactly. It's like when someone's a good striker, that doesn't mean oh, like Canelo is not the best striker. You know what I mean? Right. As soon as he fought someone who could throw some kicks, he'd you know lose. Yeah. But you know, in the same way that someone who's just the best kickboxer might not be the best striker, probably the best striker is someone who's you know in a more permissive rule set like Muay Thai, perhaps left way, but that's not the case. It's a Muay Thai fighter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that the same thing we see in, in grappling, and grappling is kind of that catch-all term for everything on the ground. I like your answer. Right now, that doesn't mean like 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 the best grappler can still have like a significant weakness. Oh, for sure. But be so strong in other areas. Are you thinking of anyone in particular? I'm thinking of Gordon. Yeah, and how he's not particularly good at uh, one part of grappling. Yeah, I would say that he's not great at wrestling. I wouldn't say he's bad, mm -hmm. you know, but I would say compared to his peers and like wrestlers, his mm -hmm. weight, he is not great at wrestling. Yeah, for sure. But he's the best at everything else. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? It'd be like talking about a quarterback. He'd be like, dude, he's got the best accuracy, the best arm strength, the best decision making. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like he's like, yeah, just like all the attributes. He's oh, he's the best, the best, the best, the best, the best. You know, but he can't run. But there's just like one, yeah, one thing. Oh, he can't, dude. He can't. Um, or he's not the best at running. Yeah, he's not the best <laughs> yeah, at exactly. running. Not yeah, that he can't. But actually, this guy's the best running quarterback. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. So yeah, but he's still the best grappler because it's like it's like your Madden rating. You know, <laughs> like yeah, it's like okay, I'm a 98 speed. I'm a 94 strength. I'm this. Mm -hmm. So overall, I'm a 96. Yeah. I'm the highest. Yeah. 
Good, good question, good answer. Yeah, that was a good question. All right, time-wise, we got. You know, let's start with this one, and then we'll see. I might be able to get back to some. Lonnie's got a couple other questions that might be good. Um, well, okay, this is the last question that I have for you. What is your favorite book on the wall behind you? <laughs> uh, ca Cowboy Up. Cowboy Up. That'd be number one. Number two. He would be um, The Confident Mind. The Confident Mind is the one that I would recommend that that, that other people are going to like the most mm -hmm. or benefit from. It's a beneficial one. Yes, definitely. The Confident Mind. The Confident Mind by Dr. Nate Zinzer. Zinzer, right here. Um, that's been incredibly valuable in my... Uh, and my mental skills. Book recommendation from Mike. Check it out. I've read, not the whole thing, but I've read a fair amount of it. And uh, very yeah. helpful, very actionable. I, re I read the whole thing. Um, and like I, I, like I would say there were different times in my competitive career where I became mentally weak and then mentally strong. And then mm -hmm. mentally weak and mentally strong. So one thing that I would say is it's something that needs, like you don't just get it. Mm -hmm. You don't get to keep it. Right, right. You have to, it's like, you can't own it, you rent it. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. Like, it's rented. Um, it's a perishable skill. Right, a perishable skill, and there's different levels of it. Like, mm -hmm. when I was younger, earlier on, I was the most confident. Yeah. I was the most, no nerves. Like, going into my fights, not even a little bit of nerves. Mm -hmm. Not even a little bit of, I couldn't fathom that I could lose. Yeah. Like, just, like, didn't make sense to me. Like, you know? And then, uh, I would lose. <laughs> like, oh, wow, I can't believe that could happen to me. Um, you know, so just, like, different eras and stuff. But this uh, was a really great resource. Mm -hmm. um, I used it strongly in my, like, my... Like, I would say, like, my last career, which is, like, competitive jujitsu. Mm -hmm. So, post-MMA, this was a, a really a really big deal. This, right here, Cowboy Up. It, it's my favorite book of all time. Now, I should let you guys know that I've read one, two, three, four, like, maybe five books in my entire life. <laughs> um, but this is my most enjoyable one. It chronicles the 2004-2005 uh, Oklahoma State Cowboy Wrestling Team. Uh, in which a kid who I who I grew up in the same like community of wrestling with Coleman Scott, uh, 2012 Olympic bronze medalist, um, he was a freshman on that team, and then a friend of mine, Zach Esposito, uh, he won the NCAA championship. He's on that team. He's the uh, the uh, <laughs> the 49 pounder, and he won the NCAA championship the year that they chronicled so for cool. the book. So it's just like super cool. I'm like, that's my friend. So yeah, yeah I, you know what I thought you were gonna say? What? I thought that was gonna be your number one. I thought this was going to be your number two because oh, you were on the cover of it. Dude, what a, I didn't see it. It was smashed. I snuck behind. it in there. Yeah, I didn't see it. Yeah, this is, uh, I read this book also. <laughs> it is the um, Minimalist Training for Maximum Results, the Combat Sports Strength and Conditioning Manual written by Will Morrill. Um, there's a, what is this called? A blurb. There's a blurb at the top. Um, so eloquently written by one Iron City Mike Wilkins pro MMA fighter pictured below right yeah in which it says the structure of this program allows me to reach peak physiological performance without infringing on the time and energy necessary for skill development which is what you want as a combat sports athlete you know your skill development your time on the mat is most important and your time in the weight room should be enhancing that mm -hmm. not taking away from it so if you read that book, you can follow some of the outlines and develop some of your own strength training routines that best suit your goals on the mat. A wonderful endorsement. Yes. And then I thought this was going to be number three. Yeah. Okay. So here goes the thing. I didn't. I, I just didn't see it. <laughs> That's fair. It's yeah. a. It's a. It's a thin one. Yeah. And I it's sort minimalist of pushed in back a little further. The, it's actually kind of out of place. It's with some fiction, but I put it. My grandpa wrote this book, so I was ah. like, "It's a it's a moral book next to a moral book." You know? Oh, yep, yeah, you got to do it. Yeah. You got to do it. Very good. Very good All question. Right. Um, you know what? We'll save any other questions we have for another episode. Right we're, on. We're running out of time. That was a fun episode. I hope <laughs> you guys liked it. I love that. I didn't know what was happening. It was a pleasant surprise. Um, maybe we'll do one in the future. Um, like. We can have like maybe someone else like filter the questions if mm -hmm. we want them to be surprised, like fan 
or or you know audience member questions. Yeah. So that so way we both hit them, and then like maybe we'll just get somebody else to be like, "Yo, read this these messages and pick out questions." Yeah, the best ones. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we'll bring someone else in to read them off to us. All right, maybe sometime we'll have to make a post and, and request some questions. Yeah, from people. let's give it some time. Let's build, yeah, yeah, yeah. build a little for bit sure, and do that. Sure. But hey, look for that in the future. That was another stellar episode of Listen to Your Coaches. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.